So actually, it's a, it's a good continuation with the previous talk. So it's I guess it's not a hazard. So well done. All right. So I, I would like to. So I, I would like to tell you that it would be a really straightforward talk. So you are supposed to understand 100 percent. So don't hesitate to interrupt me, ask any question, and you will see it's kind of uh, quite informal. So the the let's say the big uh, thematic of the talk would be on searching for new 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 physics through interference effect. Not only to TT bar, but you will see that there will be a lot of overlap with the previous, not overlap, but complementarity with the previous talk. All right, so the, uh, as an introduction, uh, Hugo told uh, a bit uh, that way as well. Uh, all the experimental searches so far has done in terms of integrated uh, cross-section, so basically total cross-section time branching ratio. But uh, as, as Hugo said, uh, there sometimes there are interference effects, and uh, they have a huge impact on the distribution, so basically it would change the line shape of uh, the observable you would look at. And most of the time wha when you do DSM physics, you require additional uh, scalar boson, let's say, and you it means that you definitely have to, to find something else than a five sigma bump discovery. Right. And LHE run 2 is actually uh, really a starting point to this kind of analysis, because you will start to be sensible to such small effects like uh, interference. So my talk would be, I, I try to divide it in three parts. Uh, the first one, I will, I, will, I will try to, to explain you what are interferences, and you all know what it is, but give you a hint of what it is on a really simple and concrete example. After, I will try to, to give you a quick, a really quick overview of what has been done and uh, what, what people are doing in this kind of field. Not that much, you will see. And at the end, I will try to... Mm, I will try to, uh, to discuss uh, kind of really few topics in order to motivate discussions and why not uh, uh, working group like activities. All right, so let's start with, with really basic stuff. So we'll take again the TT bar final state. So in life, you usually have a continuum background, a standard model background. So let's take for, because it's really easy, let's take the TT bar background. And you are looking for some, uh, some new resonances. So let's take, for example, a phi resonances. So this is your signal. So we are looking for this. And uh, as you know, we learn at high school that basically the total amplitude is the square of the continuum plus the resonance one. And you have seen the square of the background, you have the square of the signal, and you have this interference term. And many times, basically in any BSM analysis, you just neglect that. Because it's true, so many times it's, it's actually really small. And uh, we will see that it affects or not the total cross-section. But sometimes this, uh, this does not affect at all the cross-section, or sometimes it, sometime it does. But in any case, it always affects the inferior smart distribution. So we know that with the LHE2, run two, now we will start to be really sensible, and we could actually start to draw distribution. So this is really highly relevant for uh, LHE uh, physics at run two. So let's uh, try to understand a bit more what are interferences. So basically, we are dealing, so this is a usual Baglinger. And now let's start to have a look to what is, th what is this species. So when we, so for the example, we, we took the TT bar example. So this is a wheel cross-section, wheel amplitude. So basically, the interference term is more or less a wheel part of the amplitude of this resonance. OK, really good. I have a, a loop there, which is uh, my uh, induced coupling to some particles to the gluon to my new particle. So when I write the amplitude, this is looked like this. Now I'm saying, OK, the interference part will be proportional to the wheel part of this stuff. So this is high cool mathematics. And you see that the wheel part is something like this, where S hat is the uh, center of mass energy, photonic energy. All right? So what does it mean? It means that on shell, so when this S hat is uh, equal to the square mass of the particle there, the, the mass of the resonance, sorry, it means that this is vanishing. So on shell, there is no interference. All right? But you can see that it's actually totally, this, this contribution is totally asymmetric, anti-symmetric, regarding to M. Okay? Which means that if I draw this species regarding S hat, I have something which is like this. So when you compute the cross-section, you will have to integrate over S hat. Basically, this does not, compu this is does not, contrib this does not contribute at all to the total cross-section. All right. But here was a simple case. I assume that this loop factor was real. Okay, now if I put some particles which develop a phase, for example, a vector like quark, which uh, which have a mass bigger 
you just don't have the mass of the resonance, you develop a phase. So now you have to take the, the real part of these new pieces with the phase. Uh, you have this part, which is exactly as before, anti-symmetric, so it does not contribute on shell. And you have a new part, right, which is this one. So what is this piece? Now you see that on shell, it does not vanish, any it does not vanish anymore. All right? And it's symmetric regarding to M. So basically, if you draw this contribution, you have something like this. Depending on the copying, you have a, a deep or a peak, whatever. But you have something which is which does contribute to the total cross section. All right? So interferences are sensible to new physics through many ways. You see with this simple example. So I try to really sketch easily what, what happened. It means that more or less, when you study this kind this kind of finite space. If you draw, for example, in the invariant mass of the QT bar pair, you draw your differential cross section. You have the standard model background, like a continuum. You have to add this bad winner, the usual bad winner distribution, plus the wheel part of the interference, which is a, a peak and dip kind ish distribution, plus something which comes from the imaginary part induced by this loop, for example, which is a pure dip. So if, if you like a two exabit model, you have two resonances, you have to combine everything. And if you like CP violation model, you have to actually mix and do interference between your two signals. So at the, at the end of the day, you see that you end up with a total mess. So extremely model dependent. All right, so let's, uh, so I wanted to, to, to show you, uh, it's something that it is well known, but uh, it's application which has been so far uh, considered. Uh, so the first uh, big uh, utility of interference was to actually measure the width of the Higgs. So, in the, so basically you consider the standard model Higgs going to two photons. And when you look at the differential uh, distribution, due to the fact that the width is small, you see that the interference part which is big corresponds to the one which is proportional to the wheel part, so the one which is anti-symmetric. Right? So when you draw this, so this is at NLO for example, from, from Dixon and Al, you have this, this kind of uh, peak dip distribution that you have to add on the top of the Bragg-Wiener distribution. And when you add this distribution to a usual peak, you will in fact shift a bit the peak. Right? So the method which has been proposed uh, some time ago was to measure the shift, and you can link the shift to the width of the Higgs, which is somewhere here in, in this coefficient. So you see on this plot, for example, it's so from the deviation of the mass of the Higgs, you link it with the width of the Higgs. Right? So it's actually whole data, but um, by doing so, you can uh, ach achieve some, uh, some constraint like that. All right? And another remark is in other BSM series where you expect heavy resonances with border uh, widths, this kind of effect would be much, much bigger, as we will see. Another application, sorry? The bands, the air, yeah. Ah, oh, I maybe I have a slide at the end uh, regarding this measure. Ah, there. Well, I guess it's the choice of the renormalization, renormalization state. I could have a look, but I'm pretty sure that. Right. Um, so yeah, so. Obviously, there is a lot of uh, connection with uh, what we call uh, on-shell and off-shell physics. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about this. Um, uh, off-shell physics uh, involves a lot of inferences, and I will give you now another example. So we all know that uh, when we deal with uh, on-peak resonances, for example, you can write the cross-section of resonational states. You, you produce, for example, the Higgs, which decay to some fermions. Basically, the total cross-section would be proportional to this coping squared, and would be would be would involve if you wish uh, the the width of the Higgs, right? And when you actually consider the far off peak, a uh, far on peak region, which is the uh, off shell region, under such assumption, which are heavy, and there were a lot of discussion about this. So if you suppose more or less that the these coupings are the same off shell on shell, this co this uh, cross section does not depend at all on the width. So you see that. If you do a measure off shell, and you do a measure on shell, by comparing the two, you can access the width. That was the idea. But since there, there are a lot of interference in the off shell region, 
it's actually extremely important to take them into account if you want to be precise concerning the validation and concerning the prediction of the, the measurement of the, of the, the width of the hoop. So this is an example of what has been done. Many people have been involved, like Passarino and Nicolas Foer, for example. You see on this plot, so this is uh, the decay of the Higgs to, to, for example, W or Z bosons. And you see then here, so in the previous case, the, the photo photon spectroscopy, if you wish, we were measuring the interferences, interferences due to the wheel part of the propagator, the one which is anti-symmetric. Here, it's the other part. The one that we are interested in is the off-shell part, which is uh, due to the imaginary part of the propagator. Right? And the interferences, you can see it's something like 10% effect over there, the difference between the blue line and the red line. And you see that, okay, it's small, but actually it's really important if you want to infer from this measurement uh, a measurement on the X width. This is all the values as well, but I wanted to highlight the principle. And again, uh, in BSM theory, where you expect much heavier resonances with much bigger uh, widths, you would expect much more uh, effects, a uh, big effect. All right. Also, I wanted to mention uh, some work which has been done in the framework of the EFT. So you know that you, you parameterize on new physics by the introduction, for example, of new Wilson coefficients associated here, for example, the paper of, of, of uh, I thought it was Grosjean, but now it's another one. Uh, you introduce the channel 6 operator, for example, parameterized by Wilson coefficient. For example, here, CG, which parameterizes the coupling of your new resonances, of for sorry, for example, to the Higgs, to the gluons, and CT, which is a new coupling from your resonances to the top quark. You see that actually, on shell, the total cross-section is proportional to the sum of this coupling square, so there is a degeneracy. You can't, by, by making a non-shell measurement, you, you, you don't know if you had new physics if you have a deviation, you don't know if it comes from there, a, a modification to this coupling or to this coupling. But by making a, a measurement far off shell, you actually break this degeneracy, like you can see on this plot. You see the degeneracy over there. You see that actually by measuring off shell measurement, you, you can break this degeneracy. And again, this off shell measurement are really impacted. In this case, it's a diboson final set. It's really impacted by interferences. So you see why it's really important to take into account the interferences uh, effect. It can be really bad. All right, so uh, let's be a bit more pragmatic and look at these interferences effects. I told you that it was important to take them into account, more especially for L2 and 2. But let's have a, a closer look. And let's take a BSM, a generic model, all right? I have my resonances. Um, this coupling here is the one with the TT bar. And here it's, uh, it's maybe it's a useless slide, but uh, I just wanted to show you that uh, this factor, uh, to remind you, it's a really uh, well-known formula can develop an imaginary part, all right, with this usual function, it can develop an imaginary part. When the loop of the particle in the, when the particle in the loop have a mass which is uh, twice bigger as the center of mass uh, energy, all right? So, so if you wish, this is a loop factor which can develop or not an imaginary part. And I, I made a plot of this, uh, this loop factor because it's, I mean, you learn many things from that. First, if you look at the, so this is uh, the slope factor, if you wish, as a function of the uh, square root of the center of partonic center of mass energy over twice the mass of the top. Okay, let's suppose that in the loop, this is the top, right? So in the standard model, uh, the chiral fragments does not decouple. Okay, it's something really well known. So what it, what it means, it means that actually, if you look at the wheel part, the orange one, you see that the contribution, the wheel part of this slope factor is always real for a spin zero or a spin one, one half. It's, uh, sorry, sorry, it's al always non-zero. Well, well, it's not vanishing. Now, if you look at the imaginary part, of course, this is zero, but above the threshold of the top mass, it becomes to be non-zero, all right? And which, which the thing which matters is the phase. When you look at the phase, which is over there, the phase as a function of these parameters, you see that this phase goes really quickly and which pi over two, all right? And it really means something. For example, if you look at the, the value which uh, where the phase is pi over 4, what it means, it means that it's in, the s it's in the regime where the wheel part of the interference would be the same as the imaginary part, which means that the peak dip structure would be more or less of the same amplitude as the, big the, the dip uh, pattern, right? And this corresponds for a scalar or a mass of 
more or less 550 GB and a Forbes Little Scala 450 GB. And the case where the, 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 uh, the phase is pi over 2, it corresponds to the case where actually the real part of the propagator will, will not uh, contribute at all. We will only have a, a contribution coming from the peak, uh, the imaginary part, if you wish, which is the peak, the, the pure deep, right? And this corresponds to a phenol particle, uh, VSM particle of the, with the mass around 1 TV. That gives you of the kind of effects you can expect depending on the mass. And you can see that this is all linked to the phase of this uh, loop factor, obviously. So let's have a concrete example. You take a new scala, which coupled to the top, and in the loop, you take only the top contribution, standard model particle. You don't introduce whatever particle, you just put the top. Right, so this is the atlas, uh, so this is the signal over the background as a function of the invariant mass. This is uh, this uh, Brazilian uh, shadow as the uh, atlas uh, constraint. And you see in blue, so in blue this is the signal, the pure signal, uh, which is like this. Okay, well, so, ah, so okay, sometimes, oh, okay, this is excluded, you know. But this is uh, without any interference, right? So if you take it, uh, interference into account, you see that this is the real part of the propagator, the one which is responsible for a peak and a dip. You see this is something like this. So you introduce a distortion in the distribution. And now if you add the one coming from the imaginary part, you have a pure dip, right, which is actually quite big. And if you sum everything, you obtain the green uh, line, which is something like this. And you see that you are not at all expecting to have a bump, but actually something really weird, a really, really small bump, but uh, a dip which is totally within the, the uncertainty, right? And this, so this is for a scalar, and this is for absolute scalar. And this is more, you see it's more or less the same thing, and even the, the, the dip is actually even bigger. This is just to give you uh, an example, with only the top in the loop. All right, so now let's, let's try to have more, yep. Sorry? Not, I mean, uh, x bounds does not take into account. Uh, I don't think so. Well, yeah. Exactly. Well. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's let's have a look to more UV models, um, if you wish. Um, I will not uh, not talk about. I will not remind you what the MSSM is, but I will just, uh, in order to introduce few plots, I just want to to remind you the the context, if you wish. Uh, when you look at the Soda model Higgs in the framework of the MSSM, when you look at its mass, you have three parameters to tune it, if you wish. You have ten beta which is the ratio of the VEV. You have the stop masses, and you have the mixing parameter concerning the, stop sec the top section. If you want to tune 10, I mean, since 125 GV is like a really high, m high mass in the framework of the MSSM, if you want to tune 10 beta in order to increase the tree level mass, which is uh, bounded by the mass of the Z, you see that it's not enough. You really have to increase the ma massive uh, radiative correction, which comes from the stops, all right? And by doing so, it's it you can, uh, I mean, having stops which are heavy is, uh, might be a good, uh, good way to follow. Right, and by doing so, um, you are naturally needed, you are naturally interested, sorry, to, uh, to uh, a part of the parameter space where these stops are heavy and 10 beta is not that heavy, is not, sorry, uh, it's, it's small, right? So I'm just saying this in order to introduce this plot which show you in the 10 beta MA plane the constraints that you have for looking uh, to look for heavy Higgs's, right? So this, this uh, different colors indicate that uh, basically uh, the heavy Higgs are, are excluded looking at uh, WW final state, ZZ and so on. And this big blue area is uh, really uh, efficient, is uh, the heavy Higgs decaying to tau, all right? But as you can see, this, this uh, region is totally uh, fresh, if you wish. And it actually really interesting because you see that it corresponds to the low 10 beta region, and it's exactly in the area where the coupling to the heavy Higgs are enhanced uh, regarding the top quark. 
And as I said before, uh, this region is really extremely concerned by the interference effect. So it's really something that, uh, I mean, it's one of the big, op um, the big uh, deal of the LHE uh, for the second run is to actually really cover this region. And the way to do that is to really uh, measure or try to have a look, to look for this AVX with GK to TT bar, where the interference effects are not at all negligible. I wanted also to mention something. If you are not uh, uh, a big fan of the MSSM, you can maybe, maybe you say, oh, why, why we have only one generation of uh, CC generator? Why not 10? Why not? So start with two. And there was something really interesting which has been done recently, uh, uh, induced by uh, Karim Benakli and others. You realize that uh, when you take an equal two theory, when you look at the scalar potential, it's, it sounds crazy, <laughs> maybe not, but in fact, the theory realizes automatically the Eilingman limit. What it means, it means that at three level, you have n equal two theory. It means that you have a X, which is exactly standard model like, and the heavy guys does not couple at all to the gauge bosons. Which means that in if you take this plot, all these constraints uh, are not true anymore, right? So it means that you can, it's not at all excluded to have a, a Higgs of 200 GV in that region, right? So again, this uh, heavy Higgs to T bar, T -t -bar which involves a lot of interference, are really uh, important because it's still the case, because in this kind of construction, you still have the same coupling to fermions, so it's more or less the only channel in order to probe this kind of uh, construction. All right. So I, I want to give you uh, extra uh, examples. So if you take the MSSM, you have two heavy Higgses. And if they are kind of heavy, you are expecting them to uh, have uh, degenerate masses, so really close in masses. So you see that in this case, you are not expecting to have a bump, a peak, but you, have, you are expected to have a pure dip, right? Which actually fake only one uh, resonances. But here you have actually the addition of the two effects of the two heavy Higgses. In other part of the parameter space, you would have a big mass flipping between the two guys. So you see that you are not expecting a pure dip, but you are expecting something like a peak, a dip, another small peak, another dip, something kind of uh, even more complicated. All right. So this is, uh, this is now quite whole, but uh, some, some work is, some people are working to, to improve this estimation, you see. So this is kind of old now, but you see that in maybe in the future we would be really able to, to probe these kind of couplings to TT bar, including interference effect. All right, uh, a word to Fabio, which is not there, to mention his work. Uh, it's uh, some work has been done, and I guess it's uh, really important to include this interference effect at NLO. And uh, as Hugo said, um, so far for this kind of work, uh, the, procedure, the procedure is the following. The signal, uh, well, it's known at NLO, the background as well. But the missing part is basically the interference part at NLO. Uh, it sounds crazy, but mathematically speaking, it involves integral which are too complicated, and this part has not been computed. So the, so far, what people does do is they basically we weight the interference at leading order with some geometrical average of the k factors. This is a big deal, but uh, this is what people uh, do now. All right, so I will maybe not mention this so far, but some people, um, Karina and, uh, and you, uh, also um, did some work about it, and they show that actually you can be sensible to some parameter space of, uh, of supersymmetry. For example, depending on the stop mixing, it could really alter the interference uh, pattern. For example, here, if the top contributes contribution dominates in the loop, you would expect uh, not that much effect from the stops, but in the maximal mixing with the stops, you would expect big contribution for the stop. So basically, looking at this interface effects would tell you in which, uh, uh, I mean, could allow you obviously to measure some uh, some parameters of, uh, of your model, like into like the stop pa stop mixing parameter in the MSSM. All right. Uh, also, I mean, I will not remind you what are vector-like particles, but there are a lot of, they are really well motivated. Uh, well, you know that uh, the left end and right end have the same periodicities and conform under the same way on the gauge group. And then you can have uh, both left end and right end charge currents, which allow you to have a new type of mass. So I remind you that the Higgsino of the MSSM is a vector like fermion. And having this kind of mass is well motivated in many series, like a warp extra dimension, in composite X model, in gauge fiber group, in, in uh, higher uh, SUSY models. It's really well motivated, 
And uh, again, I will show you an example of uh, the kind of results and modification of analysis you can find. If, for example, if you, this was an example, so without taking ac uh, into account of the interference effect, if you add um, a center num a Q vector like quark of a mass with, for example, 800 GeV, you would, you, would, you would obtain such kind of stuff. So you see, oh, uh, for example, after two vector like quark, I this is excluded. But again, if you take into account the, uh, the uh, interference effects, you, you introduce such distortion of the line shapes that, that, that actually when you have to integrate over a beam, there is no effect at all. Okay? So this, uh, as Sabine uh, said before, this really reduce, uh, basically at the end of the day, with you include, you do the job properly, you really have weaker equation limits. So this was an example with vector-like quarks. And this is the same thing, but you are, you are changing the mass. So you introduce such big distortions that actually you are not excluding as much as before. All right, uh, how much time do I have left? Do you know? <laughs> Five minutes? All right. So maybe uh, we, ca we could maybe discuss this later. Um, I will do that quickly. Uh, well, you, you can see that actually you, you have new problematics. Uh, you challenge, for example, uh, with this kind of example that I gave you, you have like uh, non-conventional searches. You are not searching for a, for a peak. You are not searching for a peak deep, for a deep peak, for a deep, or for near peak. So it's kind of weird. You can also guess a problem with of misreconstructions. You see that events in the peak could populate the deep and vice versa. And then you have a smearing effect, which reduces significantly the line shape analysis. All right. So still in the TT bar analysis, as Diego said, uh, the systematic uncertainty is much bigger than the stati stat statistical one. And uh, so thanks to the large data, maybe you can you can afford to lower signal efficiency with higher quality of the MTT bar reconstruction. Maybe you can do that, or maybe you can actually find new techniques to reduce the systematics. But this is new things which are really uh, important concerning the TT bar final phase. And uh, something also that I would like to highlight is the uh, importance of the binning. Here you see, so obviously if you know where you would find the resonances, you choose your binning and you find a nice peak and a nice deep. But obviously in the real life, you are not choose, you don't know where is this mass. So you choose a binning and you find something like this. All right? So something which has been proposed is actually to use, to make an analysis with two binnings, with one which is off-center bins, right? So you, if you do two binnings, one with this binning and one that you have over there, you could be sensible to this kind of, uh, in one analysis you can see the big peak and deep and the other one, uh, right? So, so some stuff are being proposed in the past. All right, so now I, I would like to, to give you a really quick overview of what work has been done and not done um, in order to discuss maybe a bit later. So in the last three years, um, few people, um, I mean the main, main channel which has been studied is the TT bar one because it's the one where we all know since many years that the interference are really big. Um, mainly Martin, but other people study the digest final phase, where also you have like uh, important interference one and the di photon one. Uh, many work has been done for the di boson, uh, mainly by uh, Weinglein and uh, Stefan, Stefan Wiedler, where they actually include the singlets, um, some NLO words that I forgot to mention uh, before. And for the, I, 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 would, uh, I should mention as well that there was also the DIX one. And don't forget that in the DIX one, when we talk about interferences, what I, what I showed before, I, I presented the interference between signal and background, but there is also uh, interference between the signal, different uh, signals, right? Which is the case for DIX. And also you can study CP variation effects, so you also have interference between two signals and not with the background. So there is different kind of interference, but the patterns are more or less the same. All right, so I will skip that. And now I would like to finish with um, uh, a selective topics to motivate discussions. And I will start with a precise stop quark mass from threshold effect in the diphoton mass spectrum. This is something which I believe is quite recent. Whereas they actually propose, it's actually really interesting, they propose to measure precisely the top quark mass from the diphoton mass spectrum. You might, you might be actually uh, uh, familiar with the, with the measurement of the top mass, which many people talk about the Pitya mass, where people try to measure the, the pole mass. And these people uh, propose to, 
to measure it due to the fact that in you, will, you will measure the, the emplacement of uh, interference. Right? So basically, when you compute properly the, 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 the cross-section of the diphoton uh, signature, you have this box diagram which involves the top quark. And this, uh, the interference of this uh, diagram with the rest of the continuum would induce a threshold effect, which is purely due to uh, uh, an interference effect. And when you look at the gamma gamma invariant mass distribution, you will, you will find this kind of big dip, which is an interference effect. And by localizing this, you can measure the top quark mass. Right? So they claim that actually uh, in a linear collider, E plus E minus, you could have a precision better than 50 MeV. I'm not saying that it's, uh, I, I haven't looked really closely to the estimation, but actually I found find it uh, interesting. And my question is uh, to someone there, I don't know, I haven't, I have never seen any paper considering the presence, basically not looking for resonances, but looking for, I don't know, the clock quark or stuffs, maybe really small due to the spin, but BSM particles around the TV-ish masses, which would actually uh, modify the standard model background. Do we have the precision and enough precision in order to actually find new physics which would modify, mod modify slightly the standard model background? Yeah. Uh, but there, I was more thinking about diphoton and digest. I know. I uh, know. I mean, it's, it's really. I mean, it's really. If someone wants to sit with me and use form card during half an hour, this is something we can do. All right. <laughs> I mean, it's something really simple, not that interesting, but it, I guess it's might be well, might be interesting. We'll see. Uh, another thing, uh, I really like this paper recently, uh, where and it's really trendy to look for light particles, like like ask, uh, like uh, light actions. So there, they look for light action produced by gluon fusion, you produce an action which decay to two photons or two jets. And naively speaking, when you talk about interferences, you are expecting interference because with new physics, you will produce uh, heavier particles with large widths. And my remark is the following. So these people, they, they claim that they can improve the sensibility of Atlas and CMS and be sensible to light actions of the order of the GV at LHG. And my remark is, uh, maybe it's totally crap, but please let me know. Um, interferences is more or less a term which is proportional between the signal, the amplitude of the signal times the background. And the fraction of the interference over the signal is more or less, so this term divided by A squared, the amplitude of the signal, so which is more or less proportional to the amplitude of the background divided by the amplitude of the signal. All right? In the diphoton final states, if you look at the really light particles of the order of the GV, the background is huge. It's I don't know how many um, order of magnitude bigger than for the Higgs of 100 GV, but these terms would be really huge. So I'm wondering if actually it's well known that when you look for uh, light particles with small widths, the interference effects are really, really small. I'm wondering what, what would be the case for this kind of analysis if you can really neglect the interference effect. I don't know. This is something we might discuss. Right? Uh, an even craziest idea. I never heard about uh, any link between dark matter and interference. And it might be a way to actually, uh, when you speak about standard model METs, uh, you would expect some interference effect. But on the other side, if you would have dark matter in it, you would not expect at all any interference. It would not interfere at all with the standard model background. So I don't know if it's something which could be useful. And also, well, I'm not familiar with that, but. Um, I kind of like this paper where people propose to measure CP violation by measuring interference effects of the backward forward asymmetry introduced by, uh, if you introduce this, uh, if you wish CP variation coupling there from the Higgs decaying to Z gamma, this diagram will interfere with the box diagram and you can actually measure this, this interference effects and by measuring that you could actually infer from this CP violation in the standard model. Well, there are things like this. So if anyone is interested, we can discuss about this. And I will skip my conclusion, which might be boring. And thank you.